Hey everybody, Alan Noon here, and uh, today we're going to be picking up with part two of creating a 2D retro style platformer. So yeah, this is part two. We had begun this project a few weeks back, and um, maybe the best thing to do is kind of walk back through what we accomplished the first time and pick it up from there. So uh, we started out with the 2D side-scrolling blueprint, and we went ahead then and added this demo folder, and uh, we started creating our own content. We created our own character based off of the original template. Let's go ahead and open him up, because that's where the most of the action happens here. All right, so already, I think there's some organization we're going to want to do. But let's start with the movement down here. So if you remember, we're taking movement in. We're adding movement to the character movement component there. And then we're calling this custom event called update animation, which we'll jump to in a second. But then we're reading the axis value that comes on in, and we're comparing that to the value 0, and then determining, this will give us our facing, basically, whether we're facing left or right. And it will set the control rotation of the pawn accordingly. So you see here, we're just basically flipping on yaw 180 degrees if we're detecting a negative input. All right, so probably the next most important thing to look at is this update animation. This is a custom event that we created. And you can see it's very sloppily put together up here. But um, we're building basically our own simple state machine type of thing. Because since this is a paper 2D project, we don't have access to the animation blueprint. Currently, animation blueprint only works with uh, 3D characters, skin characters. So what we're doing is we've got an enum set up here called state. And let's jump back and take a quick look at that. So if I double click. We've just got some states for standing, running, jumping, crouch, hit, and dead. And uh, if we put that into this switch here, we can switch on enum. So every time we switch states, we can fire off a different event. So we have an event for standing. And all that does is plays the standing animation. Now, this is a clever piece of uh, code here that uh, came from the animation blueprint. Basically, we're getting the velocity of the character. We're getting the length of that vector, which basically gives us the speed, comparing that against 0. And um, if it is greater than 0, then we're going to play the run animation. And if it's less than 0 or equal to 0, then uh, we're going to play the stance animation. And then we have uh, an event here for when we switch to the jumping event. We just play the jump animation. And that is triggered down here. We have an input for jump. And uh, again, we're calling the jump function on the character movement component that makes up our blueprint character, which you can see right over here in the hierarchy, component hierarchy. All right, and what else did we do? Uh, so yeah, then if you recall, if you were watching last time, at the very last minute, we inserted uh, some functionality to actually kill off our character. So we have a dead state. And we just play a simple dead animation. It's a one-framer of him laying on the ground. and. Um, we disabled the input right at the last second, I think, before we closed out the show. So I don't like that a whole lot. Uh, really, all I want to do in update animation is update animation. I don't like the fact that we have this extra functionality hanging off of there. So one of the first things I think I'm going to do is move that around a bit. But uh, real quick, let's see what we have else of the graph here. OK, so we have a landed event. So the character movement component uh, tracks whether or not your character is in air or has landed on the ground. And basically, all we're doing there is once we've detected a landing, then we're going to set our character standing. It's basically a way to reset the character back to his original state. All right, and what else do we have? Uh, on begin play, we have a sequence of events. I like using sequences, because you can very easily organize things and determine in which order they happen. This is kind of out of order right now. Let's go ahead and move that around. OK, so uh, this is actually held over from the template project. We don't really need that, but I'll leave it there for now. That has to do with networking, the sprite. And then we added uh, some widgets. This is the health bar, basically. So we get the player controller. We create a widget attached to that. Uh, then we set that as a variable so we can refer to it later. And then we add that to the viewport. So let's see. Well, OK, we have one more piece here. So in order to test our uh, damage and our uh, health meter, we created a simple event bound to the backslash key here. You know, right away, first things first, I'm going to change that to the one key. It's just a little bit easier to get at. 
And uh, we're getting the current health. We're subtracting a value of 0.1, just applying some arbitrary damage there and subtracting that from that uh, current health. And if we are less or equal to zero, that is true, then we're gonna kill the character, go to the dead state, which of course triggers that dead animation. All right, so that's everything we've got going. So real quick, let's go ahead and hit play and see what that looks like. So here's our guy. We've got our sprites that we're running around with. We have our animations, there's our jump. Run left, run the right, stance animation. Uh, we've got some sprites that we're standing on top of there. And we can see our health meter up at the top, the blue bar. So yeah, if I hit one, it's subtracting some health. And he should die. There we go. All right. So uh, first things first, I'm going to clean this up a little bit. This is the begin play. I'm going to go ahead and call this initialize. And um, just a little bit of shorthand that I've grown accustomed to using. I uh, have developed sort of my own color coding system here. Anything like uh, on play or tick, I put in a purple box so I can find it easily. And then I think the next thing is I mentioned this disabling of the input for when we're dead. Let's get that off of the animation here. I'm just going to control X to cut it. And then up here, I'm going to control V to paste. All right. We're building this live on the fly here, so we're going to do a lot of testing back and forth. So now if I hit one, boom, okay, everything's still working just fine. Okay. This is kind of a mess. We're going to need some room. Let's go ahead and move some of these things out. Because depending on how far we get today, our animation handler can get kind of large. Oops. Crazy mouse. There we go. Okay, so where should we start? Um, you know, actually, I think this little system that we've got going up here is kind of cool. Maybe we'll flesh out the damage system first. So he's currently taking damage, but we're not really registering any hits. So I think um, let's jump back to our assets, and we'll take a look at our character sprites. And currently, we only have a handful of animations here, but we do have some source art for a hit state, and that's going to be this one here. I didn't bother naming any of these just for the sake of uh, time concerns, but let's go ahead and create an animation. That's a flip book, and we'll call that A for animation, and we'll say that's his hit frame. There we go. Again, single frame, so we don't really have to go in here and adjust anything. That's all it is. And uh, we also have this guy down here. Let's make another animation out of him. I think we can put this to use. We'll create a flipbook and call it A for animation. And uh, I'll just say sitting. All right. That'll get us started. OK, back in our character blueprint. So we start off by subtracting the health, and then we're determining whether or not we're dead. So if dead is true, we're dying. If it's false, then let's go ahead and we're going to switch the state. So let's just drag this in here, and we'll set this as hit. All right. And you see that we already have the hit event coming off of here. So you know what? This is kind of untidy. Let's go ahead and clean this up a little bit. I'm going to pull this around. OK, so I'm just going to drag off of there and then start typing flipbook. Flipbook. There we go. And our animation that we just created should show up there as hit. All right, so let's go ahead and test that. All right, cool. So that much of it works, but we need to get him back to his regular state. So you saw there that I jumped, and he went back to standing because of that landing event. So um, typically in these sorts of old school games, your guy would get like tossed up and back. So let's go ahead and add that right now. So let's drag off of there, and um, we'll add a force. And we'll put that on the, let's see, character movement component. And I'm going to go ahead and break this out. I'm going to right click and split the struct there. And this is a bit of a guessing game from time to time. So last time I tried this, it was, 
How many zeros do I have there? Let's try one more. This should throw him directly up in the air. Yeah, that's a little too much. Yeah, I haven't fully... Hold on a second here. Let's... There we go. That looks pretty good. And again, because we're hitting ground, the landing uh, condition in the character movement component is handling resetting us, so that's nice. All right. And we'll add some force. We'll throw ourselves backwards, so we'll say minus, I don't know. Double check, make sure that's roughly the same. We'll want to tweak this out a little bit, but... Okay, that's not too bad for starters. All right. But you'll notice that um, if I'm facing right, I'm getting thrown back left. But also, if I'm facing left, I'm getting thrown back the same direction, which looks a little weird. And depending on which games we're modeling our little project after, uh, we may want to throw the character the opposite direction that he's facing. So we need to figure that out. We've got that kind of going already over here. And again, I moved this too far over. Let's go ahead. I'm going to be moving stuff all afternoon here. So if you remember, this determines which direction we're facing. So let's go ahead and uh, we're going to create a new variable here. And we'll call this uh, facing. And we can just use an int for this. And we'll set that. So if we're facing to the right, facing is going to be 1. And I'm just going to control V, control, control C, control V. And if we're facing to the left, we're going to set this to negative 1. OK. So now we have a, a value that we can use back up in our throw over here. Let's go ahead and we'll drag off of this. And we'll do a multiply by int. And this is going to be our facing value. And then we'll promote this to a variable. And we'll say that's our uh, knockback. And if we go ahead and compile, we can go ahead and enter a default value there. And I think I want to start out negative. OK. All right, so let's see what happens. OK, so I hit 1. I'm thrown backwards. Now, all of a sudden, it looks like I've added too much force. Try again. That's not enough. Yeah, I find these numbers to be a little finicky. Uh, let's see here. I think that's going to be way too much, but I'll try. Yeah, it's not really a linear, you know, too crazy. Oh, that's our vertical. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. The knockback is what we want over there. Let's try that. OK, not enough juice, a little bit more. All right, why? Let's see, compile. That's our knockback. Maybe we'll try 45. All right, why are you not kicking me back? I think maybe I took out too many zeros. Let's see. All right, not having much luck. This always ends up being a bit of a guessing game for me. If anyone has any advice as to what a good range of numbers is going to be, I'm all ears. It, uh, it largely depends on the size and mass of your sprite as well. All right, we'll come back to that in a minute. Let's see if we can't figure out what else to do. Let's 
try to debug this, figure out where we've gone wrong. That's where we started. Okay. Well, let's at least test to make sure that we're kicking our guy the right direction. Okay, and let's wire this back up. Okay, facing right, kick to the left. Facing left, and kick to the right. Okay, great. Again, that is probably too hardcore. Let's try this. This is where we went south last time, but a little bit too powerful. Okay, that's a bit better anyway. We can always go back and tweak that. We'll probably do that 100 times. Okay, so very good. Um, we're throwing our guy back. Now, also, we probably want to indicate that the character has been damaged. And again, in the old school games, we um, would typically do this with some sort of blinking function. And we can do that. I think what we'll do is we'll take a look at the sprite here. If we scroll down the side, we've got, actually, we can do a search for hidden. So hidden in game, we want to be able to access that in the blueprint. So let's grab a reference to the sprite. And we'll say uh, hidden. So set hidden in game. Now if we went ahead and just tied this right onto here, he's just going to disappear and not come back. But we actually want to blink him. So we want to blink him for a set amount of time, maybe a couple seconds or something. So it sounds like what we need is a timer. So we want to set a timer. Wire that up. And we'll just create a function in a second here called blink. And this will run for, let's say, we'll blink him every quarter of a second, maybe. And it's going to loop. OK, so now we can create a custom event. Add custom event, and we'll call that blink. And we'll wire that up. OK, so real quick, let's see what we get here since we get damaged. I think we have to set a new hidden. There we go. Give that a shot. There we go. OK, so he disappeared there. That's very good. But now let's go ahead and let's see. Where do we want to go from here? So he's blinking. And we want to let's see. We'll do that for, let's put in a little bit of a delay. So he'll blink for two seconds. Let's turn this way down. All right, let's see what we get there now. We should get blinking once. And we want to set visibility again. Or hidden, rather, right? Set hidden on the sprite. Okay, and first we want to clear that timer. So let's go ahead and yeah, not doing very well with the typing today. Clear timer. And the function name is uh, blink. Okay, so let me think about this. So we go ahead and we add our force. We're setting the timer to call blink. Blink is going to set hidden in game. And actually, you know what? I think what we want to do is, since we're going to loop this, maybe I've got this backwards. Let's try this. OK. 
All right, so we're going to set hidden duration of, let's do 0 0.1. It's difficult to see. There we go. That's a bit better. That's 2. Okay, and then we clear that timer. Let me think. Is that going to do what we want? No, not at all. All right, I just set this up a few minutes ago. Should have took my notes. Let's think it through. We call our blink on the sprite. We're going to set hidden. So that was functioning. But the timer, this does need to be, we're going to loop every 0.1 seconds. We set hidden. Then we want to. This is where we want to do this. Okay. We can actually just drag right off of there. See what we get. All right, if this doesn't work, I'm just going to move on. Have to compare my notes later. Yeah. All right, no dice. All right, let's move on to something else. Okay, so uh, we've got our guy being thrown back, and let's see. We had our sitting animation. Let's go ahead and uh, let's double check our states. Let's add another one for sitting. Okay. Now, if we go ahead and compile, when we go back to our animation handler, we should see a new state for sitting. Very good. And we'll go ahead and set a flipbook there. There we are. And we've got our sitting animation. Okay. So, what we want to do is determine whether or not. Once our character gets thrown back, we want him to land, but we don't immediately want him to stand up. We want him to sit for a second and then get back up. So let's go ahead and we'll set a flag here. We're going to say uh, is hit. That's going to be a Boolean. And I'm just going to hold down B and click to get a branch. And when we're landing, if is hit, if that is true, we're going to set a new state. We'll set sitting. OK, and if false, then we should just go back to standing. All right, so now what we're going to want to do here is actually call our update animation. And we'll probably want to apply this a few times just to make sure that our animations are being updated as we're playing here. So again, we land. We determine whether or not we've been hit. If it's true, then we're going to sit down for a second. And if it's not, then we're going to stand. And then that's going to call our animation handler over here to go ahead and call the proper flipbook. So let's run over here. We hit one, and we need a little bit of a delay on there. We'll have him sit for a uh, half a second. Let's see, let's go ahead and duplicate this. Okay, and then we can set that to false. All right, and when we get hit, which is happening up here, 
go ahead and set that to true. All right, let's see what we get. Through the air, and there we go. We sat down. Okay, so now we need to get back up. And we'll just go ahead and we'll call update animation once again. And we want to set him to standing. We could just wire this right back into this loop, but in order to keep things neat. All right, let's see what that looks like. And there he goes. All right, so half a second might be a little bit short, but we can tweak that out if we want with this delay timer right there. Okay, and, you know, we should probably... Let's see, let's take a look here. Once I get hit... Yeah, I can actually still move, so we need to put that functionality back in where we're actually taking away control. And we'll do that right at the beginning over here. So let's drag this out of the way. And uh, we'll disable input. And we'll get the player. We'll get the controller. like so. Okay, and then when we can do this a couple of different places. Let's, um, since this is working down here, we'll just go ahead and do it here. We'll go ahead and re-enable control. Enable input, get the player controller. Uh, I'm going player controller. There we go. Okay, so when I get thrown through the air, I should be dead. Yeah, there we go. So I don't get control back until I'm standing. Okay, so that works pretty well. All right. Okay, let's take a look and see what we can do next here. So we've got our hit, we've got our dead, we've got our sitting, jumping and running. Well, we're not going to do crouch today. But, so this is the beginning of a pretty decent little damage system. Besides this malarkey on the end, that I'll have to look and see where I screwed that up, but I had that functioning back on my other copy. But uh, let's go ahead and take this, and uh, we're going to make a new custom event. And we'll call this uh, damage system. Right. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and add a float to this. You'll see why in a moment. And we'll call this uh, damage in. There we go. Could just wire that right into there. Okay, so now we have an event that we can call anytime the character is damaged. Uh, in order to uh, hurt the, our little guy. So let's make an enemy, or uh, how about a trap, that we can uh, inflict some pain on this dude with. So I'm going to go ahead and make a new blueprint class, and he's going to be an actor. And uh, we'll just call him BP Trap. We'll hit Enter to open him up. Okay, so uh, we have some spikes and some other stuff that we can use. I think that sounds pretty decent. So let's go ahead and add a uh, sprite component. So paper sprite. And maybe I'll just uh, duplicate that a couple of times. All right, so this bottom one here is going to be the base. So let's go find our source sprite. And let's make this a little bit bigger. There we go. So I think what I want is well down here. There we go. This looks good. We use that as our base. And I'm just going to move this over the default scene route, and that'll replace it. That makes it a little bit easier to work with. 
going to set my snaps to 1 and look at this from the front view for now. Okay. And on this sprite, let's go ahead and we're going to find our spikes. There's right there. Okay, so with him selected, we can go ahead and drag him around a little bit. We'll put him right there. And I'm going to move him forward one unit. Okay. And you know what? Let's this be faster just to delete that and then duplicate it again. Okay. Now I should be able to move him over. No. Why can't I move you? All right, I did not like that. All right, we'll just add a clean one. And there's our spike again. Very good. Right about there. And again, we'll move him forward one unit so he sits in front of that little bar. Okay, and then the final thing we need is uh, some sort of collision volume so that when our sprite interacts with this, we can fire off some events. And um, that'll allow us to not be constrained by the shape and size of the sprite either. For gameplay purposes, we could tighten up this collision volume or expand it to make it uh, more or less difficult to play. So uh, we'll just find a box. And over here down the side, Drag this out a little bit. I'll just tighten that up a little. Don't have to be exact, but let's do it like so. There we go. So he has a couple of pixels to actually sit inside of the uh, the spikes on. You know what though? Let's let's do it like this. Okay. All right, now let's, uh, with that selected, with the collision selected there, I'm going to go ahead and say this uh, generates hits, it overlaps dynamic, and then I'm going to say on component hit, or, uh, you know, let's do begin overlap. It's going to take us right to the graph, and we're going to get the other actor, and uh, let's go ahead and cast to him. And our blueprint is called BP Dude. So basically what we're doing here is calling out to the thing that's hit the uh, this collision volume. And we're saying, are you the player character or not? If you are, let's go ahead and get your health. So we'll get health current. And uh, we need to subtract something from that. So we'll add a variable here, and we'll call this damage value. And we'll set that as a float. And we'll compile. And we'll say he inflicts uh, quarter damage every time. All right. So uh, again, let's uh, let's uh, set health current this time. And we're going to go ahead and subtract the uh, damage value. So we want float minus float. And wire that into there, like so. OK, let's see what happens. So now, the idea is that uh, any sort of enemy or trap or hazard that we create will have the amount of damage that it inflicts on the player character. So every time it's hit, we just call out to that character and apply it. So let's see. So we could do this directly, like so. But we actually have that custom event. So yeah, you know what? Let's move this around. Let's. Um, that was called damage. Apply damage. Uh, no, that's not the one we want. Ours was called damage system. 
damage system. There we go. That's the cr the uh, custom event that we created. Yeah, actually, this will be easier. We're going to take this right into here. There we go. All right, now I'm going to subtract that. Okay, there we go. Much simpler. We can have all that subtraction stuff just live over on the actual dude. Yeah, there we go. So this is the damage coming in. We'll just wire that into there. All right, let's see. All right, what did we miss? So we got our trap, other actor. We're casting to him. We're going to get him. We're going to call out the damage system on him, and we're going to give him the damage value here. So that's 0.25. That should be fine. Okay, so when we come in, we're pressing 1. We're setting is hit. We're disabling input. We're getting the current health and subtracting the damage in and setting that there. Let's just debug this a little bit. So that should be the full health. Let's make sure that this value is coming in properly. Okay, so it's zero. Uh, let's clean this up here. There's our trap. It did hit point two five, right? Point two five. And our health current. Let's make sure that's going to be one. All right, very good. And we'll just test this here. I use a lot of print statements as I'm uh, working on stuff here to quickly debug. All right, so something is not subtracting properly. Damage in. Well, that's... For one, we're testing with the key. So let's go ahead and we need to drop our trap into the world. Let's start with that. All right, we'll just place him here. Now if we hit play, I think we're colliding on our sprites there. So let's go take a look at our sprites. And we take a look at the collision. Yeah, so what's happening there is I'm standing on top of the sprite and not actually hitting the collision volume. So let's just, uh, we could either delete this or take it all the way down. Let's try that. And then we may have to set our, there we go. Okay, so yeah, I was actually standing on top of the spike and my collision volume that is inflicting the damage wasn't actually ever getting to my character. So now that I'm jumping on top of it, there we go, and I'm, I'm applying quarter damage every time. That's what we want. So yeah, so this little system we can use uh, anytime we have any sort of hazard. Like I mentioned, if we have an enemy or something, just on that enemy blueprint, we just have to cast to the character and then call the damage system and then supply it a, variable, a value there through that variable. All right. Okay, how are we doing on questions? I'm not seeing any come up over here. Real quick. Okay, anything? Just doing a quick scan of the chat over here. Uh, question, isn't the input on the damage system an integer and you're feeding it a float? No, it's a float because actually, um, because of our the way that the UMG widget works, so the value that uh, we're adjusting here, let's see, should be, here we go. It, it's a percent. So if we fill that up, you see if it's a 1.0 is a full meter. So we're actually subtracting floats from that in order to uh, adjust the amount of fill. Good question. 
All right. Okay. All right. That'll be good for now. All right. So what can we do next? Maybe uh, we should get around to making this guy shoot. So first thing, uh, we're going to need something to shoot. So uh, we'll go ahead and create a new blueprint here. And this will be another actor. And this will be our uh, BP shot. And it'll have a sprite associated with it. And we'll also have a projectile movement component. All right, and I'm just going to move this over the default scene route. OK, so projectile movement. So we want to give it a speed. And um, I don't know, we'll just try like 250 to start with. And we'll make the, match speed, the max speed match. And we'll turn off gravity. So that way, as soon as this thing is born, it's just going to fly straight out. And that's probably good for now. So we need some artwork to go along with this. So let's make a new folder. And uh, we'll just call this weapons, I suppose, in case we ever get around to making some new ones. And in my project, I have a source folder here. And I have a couple of sprites that didn't make it into the original tile set, so shot one and shot two. So I'm going to go ahead and drag those in. And uh, so we've had a bit of a renaming here. If you right click, it used to be uh, configure for retro sprites, but now the new setting is apply paper 2D texture settings. So that'll uh, mask out the background and turn off bilinear filtering and all that other good stuff. All right, so let's go ahead and uh, we want to create sprites. And I'll right click again and create a flipbook. And we'll call this A for animation and shot. So that's a little bit too crazy. So again, uh, we're working in 4.8 now. And you can see the actual name of the sprite is listed on the, uh, the frame counter down on the bottom there, which is nice. OK, I think the other thing we want to do is um, maybe adjust the material. So this entire sprite set was created in black and white with the idea that we could tint it if we wanted to. But um, let's go ahead and while it's not technically retro, uh, I'm going to take advantage of some of the shiny features of UE4 and make this thing glow. And it'll show you how you can work with some of the materials. So if we go over to the material that's applied to this thing, anytime you create a sprite, this default mass material is going to be applied. So if we go ahead and find that in the content browser, you see that the, um, the actual engine folders have been opened up. So let's double click this. We see that it's a, a material instance. And we want to find the master material. So we'll go and find that in the browser. There it is. And then back up in our project, let's go ahead and uh, make another new folder. I'm going to call this materials. All right. And uh, let's go back and find that guy again. There we go. All right, so this is our source material for this sprite. Now, we don't really want to manipulate this material, because every time then we go to use it, it's going to be changed. So I'm just going to go ahead and drag right into the materials folder here, and I'm going to make a copy. So now uh, let's go ahead and rename this, and uh, we'll just call it like, uh, we'll, we'll call it our shot material, I guess. Yeah. OK. All right, and uh, what I want to do is apply a color and make it glow. So I'm going to go ahead and hold down 3 and click. And we've got our color. I'm going to right click and turn that into a parameter, and I'll just call that color. And uh, we'll multiply that in. So I'm holding down M and clicking. There we go. I'm going to unhook a vertex color here. Now, we could, uh, sprites come with a built-in functionality to actually tint things. But, um, and they use that through the vertex channel there. But I'm going to go ahead and uh, set this up this way. And 
And if I hold one and click, all right, I'm going to convert that to a parameter, and we'll call that glow. All right, so let's give this color. We'll start out. We'll start out white as the default, and this will start at one. Okay, so we can see our material. And if I go ahead and adjust this. There we go, we got a nice glow. All right, we'll just leave the default there. All right, so this is our new material. I'm going to save that, and then I'm going to right-click it and create a material instance. That way, if we had, um, you know, ice shots, they'll be blue. If we had fire shots, they could be orange and what have you. So we'll, uh, we'll just call this M shot. This will be our, uh, I don't know, laser. All right, so now I can expose these parameters here. And let's see, sprite texture, material property. Let's see, did I apply those? Let's see, where are my values? That isn't the right place. Hold on, let's turn plugins. There we go. That's a little bit cleaner. So that is material instance. So why? Where is my? There's our sprite texture, physical material. Where are my parameters? All right, scrap that. This is our M shot material, right? Got a parameter there. Aha, that doesn't help. Color and glow. Apply. Save. And we'll create a material instance. Let's try this again. There we go. Now they show up. All right, we'll go ahead and make that sort of a whitish blue. Okay, that's better. All right, so back on our sprite, go to our animation, and we can go ahead and pick our blue there. So let's save that. Now this might not actually glow behind the background. We, uh, let's go to our blueprint here. I think we have to create a new parameter our new input setting here. Let's bring this over. And we'll call this new input shoot. I'm just going to hook that up to the mouse button. Say left mouse. Okay, I'm back on our character. Where's a good place to put this? I suppose down here somewhere. So we'll say shoot. And we want to spawn an actor from class. And it's going to be our BP shot. All right, so we need to supply it with a transform, a, an actual position, rotation, and scale. Let's go back to our viewport here. And uh, when this character is performing his shot, he's actually going to raise his arm. So, you know, let's give ourselves a little bit of a helper. I'm going to use an arrow. All right, and that's kind of large, so we'll scale that down. And I'm going to say that maybe when he shoots, his hand is roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of this. We can tweak this out later. Okay. So now we can get that. Oh, what did we miss here? Yeah, see, it's complaining about the transform because I compiled. So let's go ahead and grab that arrow. And we will uh, get the transform. And we probably want the world transform. Get world transform. We can supply that into that pin. 
We'll say we'll spawn even if we're colliding, and that should clean up the error there. All right. So we're shooting, and let's see. We don't have a shooting animation, so let's go ahead and set that up. So we need to head back to our character states. We'll add another one here. Call that shooting. Okay, great. And again, we'll set another flip book. And we need a shooting animation, so let's go back to our source art. And uh, we've got jumping, shooting, running, shooting, and uh, standing. We'll just start with the standing. That's this one here. So we'll go ahead and right click and create a flip book, and we'll call that shoot. to our dude. All right. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and update animation. All right. That should make sure that gets called. Okay. So when we shoot, we spawn the actor from the shot class. Spawn transform is of the arrow. And let's see, anything else? All right, why are you not shooting? Let's double check and make sure that we're actually calling that. All right, so shoot is being called. Let's double check. Oh, so here we go. Uh, we went ahead and made our uh, animation, but we didn't actually hook up our sprite. So let's find our uh, shot. There's that one there. Got our projectile movement. Actually, you know what? Let's go ahead and I think we can just set a flipbook instead of a sprite. Yeah, paper flipbook. Let's do that instead. And shot. That's the one. All right, we probably don't even need this guy anymore. There we go. That looks a little bit better. There we go. Okay, so he's glowing a little bit, but somewhat difficult to see, and uh, I believe that's due to our Sky Dome back here. There we go. So now I have some cool lens flares going on. Okay, so uh, we got a few things done today. Hooked up some new animations. We got our guy firing. Oh, you know what? He isn't actually playing his firing animation, is he? We have a few minutes here. We can take a look at that. So uh, he's updating his animation because we did not set his state. So let's set that to shooting. All right, let's try that. There we go. That looks a little better. Looks like our arrow could probably be up a couple of points, but good enough for today. So yeah, maybe next time we pick this up, we will uh, hook up the running so that he can run and shoot. Yeah, he's not coming out of his shot state right now, but I think uh, what I would probably do here is, you know what, maybe real quick, we probably have time for this. Let's do a re-triggerable, let's see if this works, re-triggerable delay, and uh, well, we'll give it half a second. That seems kind of long, but uh, we'll set the state. To standing and again we'll update animation we can just borrow that one there so uh, we fire and then after half a second we go back to standing so that way um, if you're spamming the fire button he keeps his arm out and he won't like keep dropping it and you won't get that glitchy looking um, 
situation going on. So, all right, cool. Glad that worked. And also, we hooked up our uh, trap. We made our enemy guy. I'll have a look and see why my uh, blinking wasn't working. Um, I think I forgot a note or two in there somewhere. I got it out of order. There we go. OK, cool. Uh, real quick, let's take a look and see what other questions. Can you give him a grappling hook? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, maybe we will uh, add that in the next stream. Uh, I laugh because a number of years ago, I worked on a project where we wanted to add a grappling hook. And we're told on numerous occasions, grappling hooks are impossible. So yeah, that was <laughs> good times. All right, another question. Given the massive engine overhead when <laughs> doing 2D, would this not run faster as a 3D game with side-on camera? Um, well, so the 2D and 3D worlds are um, actually one and the same, really, in Unreal. Uh, the paper 2D features that I'm using you know, with sprites and uh, you know, flip books and all that other stuff, they still do exist within the 3D world. So if I'm moving around, you see here, there is, there is depth going on. So you're not strictly limited to 2D. You can do 3D. If we went and changed our camera over here, and I think we showed this on the first time around. All right, if we swap that to a perspective view, now this could look, well, we don't really have anything worth uh, of any depth to show off of um, the effect, but... Yeah, so if we extruded those blocks out or put background back there, you'd be able to actually see perspective. Um, so the 2D and 3D worlds, as I was saying, are uh, really one and the same. All right, um, another question coming up. Yes, actually, okay, so the question here is, couldn't you jump into the spikes backwards and push you forward as an exploit? Yeah, and actually that was on purpose, and I forgot to mention that because um, depending on how you implement this stuff and what you do, you can come up with some pretty neat gameplay uh, features. So yeah, if I jump forward and click back right at the last second, oh, it looks like I've lost my throwback. But uh, yeah, I could be thrown an extra distance. So like, what could be cool is, let's say this is a big gap, and then over on the other right-hand side, I have um, you know another ledge that I want to get to. But maybe down below, there's a hidden area, and I can only get to it if I get that extra boost by running, jumping onto some spikes that are placed at the edge and then quickly facing the other direction, that would launch me into the new area. So yeah, you can do some pretty cool stuff. Uh, now, the other thing that we didn't set up is we could have set up a flag to determine whether or not you're hit. And um, we can enable and disable that so that your character can take multiple hits. Well, we do have is hit, right? But um, depending on how we set it up, we could have it so that if you get hit and you bounce, you could get hit again and hit again and hit again. So you could come up with some really interesting level designs where if your character has made it through the level to a certain point and you have enough health, you could sacrifice some of that to get to a new inaccessible area or you know make it around a particular enemy. So there's all sorts of cool stuff that you can set up like that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. OK, I don't see any other questions coming through. But um, yeah, there's lots more we could do with this. We could add grappling hooks, um, flame traps, all sorts of stuff, double jumps, triple jumps. Uh, and then the one thing that we still haven't touched on are tile maps, which in 4.8, there's a whole bunch of new functionality there. Uh, a little bit too much to get into today. But uh, tile maps are really cool, really powerful, a lot of fun. Uh, you basically, you can piecemeal together objects and level art and what have you just out of a small subset of uh, sprites. So definitely check that out. And uh, yeah, I think that's probably it for today. So thank you very much. We'll see you again. <laughs> <laughs>